Good evening. I'm Spot On Weather Meteorologist Matthew Euler, and tonight we're going to move into the next video in our summer video weather training series, and we're going to talk about atmospheric waves. And this is such a very important topic that I've decided to divide up this training into two parts. So tonight we're going to talk about the different components of atmospheric waves. Um, just think about the atmosphere as being a three-dimensional fluid and these little waves form in that fluid and they play such significant roles, such significant roles in our weather that we have here at the Earth's surface. Um, the atmosphere is a three-dimensional fluid as I mentioned and so it's going to be very important that we go over this before I really get into the training videos on um, particular types of storms, um, what really sets them apart from other disturbances in the atmosphere. Um, part one, we're going to do a quick introduction to waves. And then in part two, I'm going to break down the difference between long waves and short waves. Very important in the field of meteorology. Uh, the title slide tonight shows uh, a couple different waves. Uh, the image on the left, the uh, red L's indicate upper level lows. And in general, those dashed lines that you see associated with those red L's, those upper level lows, those are associated with uh, troughs. The dashed lines represent troughs or a bending of the jet stream. Uh, in this case, we have five total long waves on this particular image on the left. And they're numbered one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, the image on the right, the upper right, that shows how the long waves appear over the whole, if I'm looking down from the North Pole, um, all those maroon reddish colors indicates where the main jet stream is, and that's associated with longer waves. Um, and we'll get into that in part two of the training. Uh, in the bottom image, bottom right, I'm showing what is known as a short wave. In this case, we're looking at a short wave trough. The amplitude uh, basically uh, is, can sometimes be deeper, but the wavelength is definitely much shorter with a short wave trough or a short wave ridge. So these, these features really do play a large part in the weather we experience. So let's go ahead and kick off part one, and we're going to first talk about atmospheric wave terminology. Um, the first thing we need to talk about is a ridge. A ridge, sometimes on my weather videos you hear me mention about ridges at the uh, jet stream level. Uh, it's an elongated area of relatively high atmospheric pressure or heights. And it's associated with, when I say anticyclonic, um, that just simply means, uh, just think about the motion uh, of, of clock hands, all right? Anticyclonic is the same thing as clock hand turning clockwise. So if you look at a clock, you notice how the arrows kind of move around in a clockwise manner. Um, and there's lower values of vorticity associated with the ridge. The ridge axis itself, <coughs> this is a line of maximum anticyclonic turning and height or pressure contours and the wind flow. And it's associated with what's known as vorticity minimum. A trough is an elongated area of relatively low atmospheric pressure or heights and it's associated with cyclonic turning, the opposite of a ridge, and has higher values of vorticity, sometimes known as positive vorticity. It is located out ahead of a trough. Now, the trough axis is that line of maximum cyclonic turning and height or pressure contours and the wind flow, and it's associated with a vorticity maximum or a positive vorticity. Uh, so we're going to go, I'm going to show you what this stuff looks like. Just a quick introduction on the terms associated with atmospheric waves, ridge, ridge axis, trough, and trough axis. Another thing we have to talk about when we talk about waves is what's known as an inflection point. And this is basically the point between a ridge and a trough. Um, and, and the curvature changes at the inflection point from an <coughs> anticyclonic to a cyclonic flow, or vice versa, cyclonic to anticyclonic. The air parcels at the inflection point basically are moving in straight line flow. So there's no curvature involved in the wind flow when you're talking about the inflection point. Wavelength is the distance from a ridge axis to a ridge axis, or a trough axis to a trough axis, or even inflection point to inflection point. Again, I'll show you what this looks like uh, graphically here in a minute. 
The preferred meteorological practice is to use the segment between the two adjacent ridges so that the trough is in the middle of the wavelength. That's preferred to determine you know, where the wavelength is. Amplitude, this is the distance from the inflection point to the crest of the ridge or the base of the trough. And the amplitude is basically one half the distance between the crest of the ridge and the base of the trough. And it's measured parallel to the ridge or trough axes. Okay, so the bottom image here really helps graphically explain these terms. You know, we talked about what a ridge is. Um, that's an area of upper level heights. It's a maximum upper level heights. We get maximum anticyclonic turning or clockwise turning. Um, so if you look at the main solid line of the diagram here, that indicates where your troughs and ridges are. Whenever you see an upside down U pattern, that is associated with the ridge. And you'll see that almost that jagged line there that represents the ridge axis. See the jagged line underneath the word ridge on the bottom left part of the image. And then also above the word ridge, um, there's a jagged line that goes up. And that's the ridge axis. That's the point of the highest um, heights or the highest atmospheric pressure. The... Um, the trough, on the other hand, is if you look to the far right, bottom right, you see the trough, and that's represented by the trough axis is represented by the dashed line that basically starts below the trough axis words and goes all the way down. So the trough, just imagine, imagine if you had a bowl, the trough would be the lowest point in the bowl. Okay, if I flip the bowl over, um, the ridge would be the highest point on the bowl. So flip that bowl over upside down and the ridge would be the highest point, okay? Um, wavelength is a distance again from the ridge axis to the next ridge axis and that's represented the upper, upper left hand portion of the diagram and also it can be measured from the trough axis to the next trough axis. Um, that's the bottom middle part of the image says wavelength with the arrows and it can also, wavelength can be measured from inflection point to inflection point. Remember inflection point is the point um, with a straight line flow. It's a transition area between a trough to a ridge or a ridge to a trough. And then amplitude. Amplitude is that, it's basically half the vertical distance um, between the, in this example, trough axis to the inflection point. So amplitude rep represent one half the total vertical distance between the trough axis and that next ridge axis. But in general, amplitude, think of from the trough axis to the inflection point. Okay, the, um, the, the dashed line there down the middle of this horizontally, that represents your inflection point. All right, so we talk about atmospheric waves. Uh, we talk about the wave amplification theory. And it's developed from the height tendency equation that's not shown. It's also based on something fancy that's called the quasi-geostrophic or QG theory. Now, I'm not going to get that in depth. I'm trying to keep this a very simple discussion for the training, for the summer video weather training series. So, you know, I kind of just listen to me on that, but we'll just kind of move on. I'm not going to delve too deep into that. Wave amplification on the synoptic scale is dependent on the variation of temperature. When I say temperature advection, uh, I'm talking about a horizontal, uh, horizontal changes in the air masses blown by wind. Uh, temperature advection... For example, if I have colder air coming in to my location on northwest winds, that would be an example of cold air vection where the temperatures get colder. Warm air vection is where you have more of a southerly or southwesterly wind that usually leads to increasing or warming temperatures. Uh, warm air vection, uh, warmer temperatures blowing in on south, a southerly wind of some sort. Um, so that's all temperature vection is, is a change of temperature over a horizontal distance and the wind is generally responsible for advecting or bringing in those colder or warmer temperatures. Uh, in this case, wave amplification has to do with three dimensions of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not just a two-dimensional flat horizontal plane. Uh, you have to look at everything from the uh, land surface, the surface of the earth, all the way up to that jet stream level at 30,000 feet or 40,000 feet. Um, so when I say changes of temperature with height, temperature evection with height. Um, as there's colder air, um, as you go up in height, it's generally going to be supporting your troughs. If I have warming air sloped to the west with height, that's going to be supporting your ridges. 
And that's, you'll see what happens here. Um, let's just move on. Um, for synoptic scale, mid-latitude system. So when I say synoptic scale, I want you to think of the scale of weather fronts, cold, warm, stationary, uh, occluded, uh, high and low pressure systems at the surface. Those are examples of synoptic scale features. Uh, when I talk about mid-latitude systems, I'm generally talking about the, the storm systems that we are very familiar with here in the United States for the latitudes of the westerly wind belt from 30 to 60 degrees in the northern hemisphere, 60, 30 to 60 degrees north. Um, in the southern hemisphere, it would be 30 to 60 degrees south. That's the middle latitudes. Um, so for the synoptic scale middle latitude systems, uh, temperature advection or changes with temperature in the horizontal, it's normally maximized in the lower troposphere. And lower troposphere, that troposphere, um, when we did the video weather video training series one, the first video of the series, we talked about the layers of the atmosphere with the troposphere being closest and where all the weather occurs is closest to the Earth's surface. So we have temperature changes or evection in the horizontal is normally maximized in the lower troposphere near the top of the boundary layer. Now we did talk about the boundary layer. If you review the training on the atmosphere, we talked about the boundary layer and generally the boundary layer, the planetary boundary layer, extends from the Earth's surface to about 3,000 feet above the ground level. Um, uh, top of the boundary layer is generally up at around 3,000 feet above ground level. Now, if we assume that magnitude of temperature advection or changes, if it decreases with height as we go upward into the middle and upper troposphere, then the following relationships apply. First, warm air advection in the lower troposphere is going to do a couple things. First, it's going to force the heights to rise in the middle and upper troposphere. Why is that? Why, when we have warmer air coming into an area, you know, we have, let's say we have southwest winds here at the Earth's surface, look at a weather observation, get this warmer air blowing into your area, that warmer air here closer to the ground is going to force the heights to rise because warmer air is much more buoyant and whenever you have warmer air moving into an area, it causes the atmosphere to expand, expand in height because that lighter air, right, there's lower density associated with it. So you have the heights in the upper level, the middle of the upper troposphere, they're going to rise. Uh, so with that being said, when I have warm air advection or warmer air moving into an area, if it's going into a ridge, now remember what a ridge is. We already kind of covered that. That's that area of anticyclonic turning. That's the area where we have the highest heights. Um, the ridge, if you put warmer air into a ridge, it causes the heights to rise. And guess what? Ridges love warm air. They really like warm air, and that eventually is going to help strengthen or amplify. We usually refer to as a ridge building. Uh, so a ridge is going to build. If you have warm air vection, on the other hand, warmer air moving in to the middle and upper troposphere, it's going to cause what's known as that trough. That's that lowest, um, the, the lowest heights uh, location is the trough. It's where the winds turn, anti, or turn cyclonically. So if warmer air comes into a trough, it's going to cause the heights to rise. And the trough is going to de-amplify. When I say dampen, that means weaken. Okay. So bottom line here is upper level ridges, they really do love warm air. So we bring warmer air temperatures via warm air advection into a ridge. It's going to build. It's going to love it. But if you bring that same warm air into a trough, an area of lower heights, it's going to cause those heights to rise. And guess what? A trough does not like warm temperatures. So if you have warmer air into a trough, it causes that trough to de-amplify or dampen. Uh, another way to say it is to uh, fill or weaken. Now, let's look at the other example here. Let, let's, let's say now we have cold air advection, cold air moving into an area in the lower troposphere. Right? When we have colder air, the atmosphere is much more dense because cold air is dense. So things are much more compact. So what happens is, is with colder air blowing into the lower troposphere, let's say we have northerly winds or northwesterly winds here in the northern hemisphere, that's going to cause my upper level heights in the middle upper troposphere to fall. 
because the atmosphere is much more dense. So the upper level heights are going to sink and get closer and more compact, get closer to the Earth's surface. That cold air, as it advects into a ridge, it's going to cause the heights to fall and the ridge is going to deamplify or weaken. So ridges do not like, the upper level ridges do not like the cold air moving into them. They want the warmer air because they want those heights to rise. You get the cold air coming in, it's more dense, it causes those upper level heights, the mid to upper troposphere to fall and that ridge weakens. On the other hand, cold air advection coming in to a trough, troughs love colder air because troughs are already areas of lower heights. So if I bring colder air into the middle and upper troposphere, right, or in the lower troposphere rather, that's gonna cause my heights to fall and the trough to amplify in the middle to upper troposphere or deepen, all right? So simply put, ridges do not like cold air, causes ridges to weaken. Upper level troughs love cold air. So cold air advection into a trough causes those heights to fall and the trough to get stronger, amplify, or deepen. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I'm trying to break this down as simple as I can. Now wave speed, how fast a wave moves is partially a function of its size. So you can have changes in the amplitude of a wave that can affect its motion. And just generally, this is a good rule of thumb. Waves with larger amplitudes generally move slower, whereas waves with smaller amplitudes generally move faster. The way I like to look at this is imagine your larger amplitude waves. Now remember amplitude is one half the total vertical distance between the trough axis and the ridge axis, or simply put, an amplitude starts at the trough axis up to the inflection point. Right? That's that. It's the one half of the total um, depth of that wave. Now, larger amplitude waves are generally going to be associated with your long waves. Uh, long waves are generally associated um, with the troughs and the ridges at the jet stream level. Okay. Smaller amplitude waves, I want you to think of shorter waves. These are the little short waves that can be real good weather makers for us here on the Earth's surface, and they generally form uh, 10,000 feet and about 18,000 feet, the middle of the, tro middle of the atmosphere in general. So with wave speed, the, it just basically refers to the distance the wave moves in a given amount of time. So if I were to look at a, let's say, a short wave, Let's say I have a short wave over Washington State. 24 hours later, that same short wave is now over the Dakotas. That's your wave speed. I'll be able to calculate the wave speed because I'll be able to see, okay, well, how much distance was traveled between Washington State and the Dakotas. Um, and it happened over, I know the time frame, over a 24-hour period. So if I can, I can ultimately figure out how fast that wave is moving. The wave speed is usually measured in nautical miles per hour also known as knots. Keep in mind wave speed. When we talk about wave speed, we talk about the wave speed theory, which says wave speed is dependent on two major influences. Speed of the flow in which the wave is embedded. So how fast are the winds blowing? How fast are they moving this wave along? If you have a stronger westerly component of the wind, you get faster wave movement. And in this case, you get stronger westerly components of winds during the winter time because you have a stronger jet stream. And that stronger jet stream is generally going to push those waves along much quicker. While weak westerly component of wind in the mid-latitude, you get a slower movement of the waves. So you need to think summertime here because the jet stream is much weaker. You get a much weaker westerly component in the summer as the um, temperature gradient in the lower atmosphere is much less. Another thing that wave speed is dependent upon is vorticity advection. Keep in mind that vorticity is just simply, I'm gonna break it down real simple for you. Vorticity is just the rate of spin of a imaginary air parcel, okay? So we look at vorticity advection, especially associated with the short waves. Those waves which form at 18,000 to 10,000 feet. All right, we have a couple different types of vorticity infection. When I say vorticity and I say infection, 
I'm just saying that different values of vorticity are going to be blown into an area in the upper levels of the atmosphere. That's all I'm referring to. So absolute vorticity is the first type of vorticity we'll talk about. And this equals, it's basically equal to the sum. When I say the word sum, S-U-M, that's referring to addition. It equals the sum of relative vorticity plus the planetary vorticity. Uh, thus, the absolute vorticity is equal to relative vorticity plus planetary vorticity. Okay, it's just basically restated in that second bullet there. Um, but so you have absolute vorticity, that's the total vorticity. All right. So if you get positive absolute vorticity infection, or PVA, positive vorticity infection, okay, this is going to cause the upper level heights to fall. For example, at the 500 millibar level, or at 500 millibars, um, that's 18,000 feet in the atmosphere. Okay. If you get negative absolute vorticity infection, or NVA, negative vorticity infection, this causes the heights of a surface to rise. For example, we'll take an effect at the 500 millibar level again, the 18,000 foot level. Okay, so vorticity infection is very, very important. If you've watched some of my forecast videos, I'll throw occasional images of how everything comes together in the atmosphere, especially when we're talking about a big storm. Uh, I'll, I'll mention, I'll throw up a 500 millibar chart. Um, I'll, talk to, I'll talk to you about, you know, the colors on that chart, the yellows and the oranges and the reds indicate positive vorticity infection. When I say positive vorticity infection, that means I'm having higher values of vorticity being blown into my area. On the other hand, if I talk about negative vorticity infection, that generally results and is associated with sinking air motion. The upper level heights tend to rise in that case. Positive vorticity infection is generally associated with upper level troughs, and that's going to result in rising air motion. Negative vorticity infection is going to result in sinking air motion. It's generally associated with fair weather, nice weather. So it's important to look at these charts in the middle levels of the atmosphere. Look for these short waves. And I will break down part two. We'll cover the major characteristics of long versus short waves so you can get a real feel for what these are about. Just keep in mind this. In long waves, generally spanning more than 10,000 kilometers, the planetary infection is much greater than the relative infection. Thus, the sign of planetary infection determines whether absolute infection will be positive or negative. Right? Again, PVA stands for positive vorticity infection. It occurs when we have higher values of vorticity being blown into an area on the upper level winds. And then negative vorticity infection refers to when heights rise. With rising heights, okay, you generally have sinking air motion associated with NVA, rising air motion with PVA. In northwesterly flow, if we're upstream of the trough axis, or basically in the northern hemisphere, we're to the west or northwest of that trough axis, planetary infection is positive because you have wind blowing from a higher vorticity value to a lower vorticity value. Thus, generally what you have happen in the northern hemisphere, especially uh, with positive vorticity infection, it produces height falls upstream or to the west of the trough. When you get the height falls going on, now you get some upper vertical motion and usually sets off a storm system of some sort. In southwesterly flow, on the other hand, downstream of the trough axis, the planetary infection is negative. The wind is blowing from lower to higher vorticity values. Thus, negative vorticity infection produces height rises downstream or east of the trough. All right, so we have height falls to the west of the trough axis in this case, and then um, negative vorticity infection is generally to the, um, to the other side of the trough. So height falls occur west of the trough axis, height rises east of the trough axis. This forces the trough to retrograde. When I say retrograde, I'm just basically meaning that the trough is going to move against the westerly winds. It's going to reposition itself toward the west against that wind flow. Now in much shorter wavelength waves, okay, so what we talked about here was long waves. So with long waves, you generally have height falls west of the long wave trough axis, height rises east of the long wave trough axis. Okay. 
in much shorter wavelength waves, shorter short waves, the relative vorticity of infection is much greater than the planetary vorticity of infection. Thus, the sign of the relative vorticity of infection determines whether absolute vorticity will be positive or negative. Okay, so one important thing I need to mention is with longer waves, planetary advection is much stronger. And it is because your wavelengths are, uh, the wavelengths are much larger with long waves. Um, so it covers a much broader, bigger scale in longitude, in width. So therefore, planetary advection is much more of a factor with long waves. Whereas with short waves, you have relative vorticity. Um, you have much shorter wavelength waves. And so you have relative vorticity, which is going to determine your absolute vorticity being positive or negative. So with short waves now, in southwesterly flow downstream of the shortwave trough axis, relative vorticity infection is positive. Thus, positive vorticity infection produces height falls downstream east of the trough axis, allowing the trough to prograde or move wet eastward. So with a short wave, you have the opposite occurrence here. You have the positive vorticity infection to the east of the trough. However, upstream to the northwest of the trough axis, the relative vorticity infection is negative. Thus, at short waves, with short waves, the negative vorticity infection produces height rises upstream or west of the trough, allowing the trough to prograde eastward with the flow. So bottom line here with short waves, the flow of short waves movement is generally from west to east because of this. All right. And the bottom, the main point to remember with short waves is the positive vorticity infection is ahead of the trough, the negative vorticity infection is behind the trough. So as a result, height falls occur east of the trough axis with short waves, height rises occur west of the trough axis, and they force the trough to propagate or move eastward with the upper level winds. Now, just a quick wavelength wave speed relationship talk. Um, larger wavelengths waves. So we can think long waves. Think of those waves on the jet stream, the jet stream level at 30 to 40,000 feet above the ground. With larger wavelengths, the waves generally move slower. With smaller wavelengths, those short waves on the middle levels of the atmosphere, those smaller wavelength waves are moving much quicker, faster. Now we move into what's known as a wave phase relationship. What we need to look at when we look at a wave phase relationship, and I'm gonna show you this graphically here in a moment. We have to compare the height contours with um, you know, thickness lines or with uh, isotherms lines of equal temperature. Um, we need to make some comparisons here. We, we have waves of different varying wavelengths and amplitudes are often horizontally superimposed on one another in the atmosphere. When I say that waves are in phase, the trough or the ridge axes of two or more waves will align or superimpose themselves on each other. The trough or ridge is going to amplify, in this case, amplify or deepen due to constructive interference. When I say the word constructive interference, all I'm referring to is that things are in phase, um, I'll show you here in a minute graphically, but the waves are basically lined up perfectly with each other. The troughs are lined up with the troughs. The ridges are lined up with the ridges. And I'll show you what this looks like here in a minute. Whenever I have this phasing of major troughs or ridges in split jet stream flow, this often leads to sudden and dramatic increases in what's known as baroclinicity. Um, that's an area, we have baroclinic zone, that's an area where storms like to form. So we have a dramatic increase in those storm producing areas and storminess occurs near the amplifying trough. This is where we get the bomb cyclones. We have the phasing of the major troughs or ridges in split jet stream flow. On the other hand, when we have out of phase relationships, this is when the trough or ridge axes of two or more waves, they do not line up with each other. In this case, the trough or ridge uh, is going to deamplify or dampen due to what's known as destructive interference. So when I have destructive interference, uh, this is when maybe I have a ridge over a trough, a trough um, below a ridge, however you want to phrase it, they're not lined up perfectly. This longitudinal damping of major troughs or ridges 
often leads to sudden and dramatic decrease in baroclinicity and storminess near the dampening trough. If my trough is not deepening, that is going to um, inhibit storm development at the surface where we live. So if, if let's just take a look at height and temperature. Let's look at height contours and temperature lines, isotherms. And let's look at the wave axis thermal axis relationship. So if we're in phase, the height ridges troughs and the thermal ridges troughs are nearly parallel to each other. If we're out of phase, the height ridges troughs and thermal ridges troughs do not parallel each other. Here's an example now. We look at wave phase relationships, right? The dashed lines on these two images, the in phase and out of phase images, the dashed lines represent lines of equal temperature in degrees Celsius. They're known as isotherms. Iso meaning equal, therms meaning temperature. All right, and the, the solid lines on these charts, or on these, these images here, the solid lines represent what's known as height contours. So, for example, the image on the left, 564, um, that's 564 decameters. Everywhere along that line, if you followed it along into the trough axis, that everywhere on that point would be 564 decameters of height. Uh, the, the next solid line below 564 is 570 decameters. Then you have 576, then 582. So the solid lines are height contours, lines of equal height, geopotential height above the Earth's surface. The image on the left shows an in-phase relationship. And do you notice one thing here? The isotherms lines of equal temperature, those dashed lines, um, and the darker solid lines, the height contours, are generally parallel to each other. So you notice the dashed lines never cross the solid height contour lines. In this case, we have what's known as an in-phase relationship, where the temperature trough, or the lowest dipping point of that, those dashed lines, it mirrors the height contour trough, the height trough, the solid lines. So you see the two dark dash lines uh, on the left-hand image, in phase image. They're lined up or they're, they're laid up right over the top of each other perfectly. There's, there's no crossing of these lines to each other. The dash lines are parallel to the solid height contour lines. Whereas the image on the right, I have an out of phase example. Um, notice that your temperature trough, the dash line is well to the west of the height trough. Um, notice that your temperature trough, see how your dip of your dash lines occurs compared to where your solid line trough is, where your, where your lowest point is of the solid lines, the height contours. Um, also notice one other thing here on the out of phase uh, situation. Um, this is a case where those dashed isotherm lines of equal temperature do cross over the height contours of solid black lines. So you see how those dashed lines cross over or intersect the solid lines. That's an example of an out of phase relationship. So very important here, the out of phase relationship generally promotes storm development. The in phase relationship on the left does not promote storm development. Okay. That now leads us into the topic of barotropic versus baroclinic. We talk about temperature and height contour relationships. We're comparing those isotherms lines of equal temperature to the uh, height contours to see if we have a barotropic situation or a baroclinic situation. Barotropic literally means the state of the atmosphere where temperature remains unchanged on isobaric or pressure surfaces. Bar barotropic means there's no temperature changes, there's no temperature advection, there's no fronts. Barotropic situation, uh, if you like to think about it, would be um, the same air mass day after day after day with no frontal systems moving into the area to change the temperature. So constant pressure maps such as the 850 millibar chart, that's at 5,000 feet above the ground, or the 500 millibar chart at 18,000 feet above the ground, contain no isotherms, lines of equal temperature, or temperature gradients. Okay? So if you have a barotropic situation, you don't really have a, a very big temperature gradient or change in temperature, you're going to have a fairly weak wind flow. And as a result, with such a weak movement of air, there's really no vertical wind shear allowed. Um, vertical wind shear, again, refers to a change in wind speed or direction with height. Um, thus, there's no change in wind speed or direction with height. Um, thus, there's no thermal wind. 
Barotropic atmospheres are very rare in the real atmosphere, uh, especially in the middle latitudes where we live, because there's usually some sort of funnel system or high or low pressure system on the synoptic scale uh, with its clockwise and counterclockwise wind flows that generally allow the air masses to collide with each other. Barotropic atmospheres most likely are found in the deep tropics. So when you go on that nice vacation, you know, maybe to a cruise ship, maybe just go down to Jamaica, Cancun, locations like that, Hawaii, you get deep into the tropics, you're going to have a barotropic atmosphere. You look at the overall weather for um, Honolulu, for example, really no changes um, throughout the whole winter or the whole, whole year between winter and summer. That's a barotropic atmosphere. If we were looking at the height contours, the solid black lines, and the isotherms, the lines of equal temperature, you notice that for the most part, they parallel each other. So barotropic, again, no temperature infection. Uh, generally, temperatures remain the same, no frontal systems, very weak temperature gradients, therefore very weak pressure gradients. The only time in the tropics you get a very strong change in pressure over a distance is with a tropical cyclone. But other than that, you're going to have a fairly weak flow. There's another type of condition that's called equivalent barotropic. Uh, it's, a, it's affiliated with everyday term barotropic. And it's a state of the atmosphere where the isotherms can exist on isobaric charts. But these isotherms are parallel to the height contours. So you have an in-phase relationship. Vertical shear is allowed with an equivalent barotropic atmosphere. However, only wind speed may change with height, so the direction remains the same at every level. If I were to go up from the surface all the way up to 30,000 feet above where you're located, the wind speed is the only thing that changes, but the direction of that wind remains the same direction all the way up. Thus, with a equivalent barotropic, you do get a thermal wind, but there's still no temperature affection. Any barotropic condition of the atmosphere, there is no temperature changes. And equivalent barotropic atmospheres frequently do occur in the mid-latitudes. Now, this is the important one, baroclinic. This, this, this is very important as far as our changeable weather in the mid-latitudes. When I say something's baroclinic, the state of the atmosphere, where those lines of equal temperature, those isotherms exist, on isobaric or constant pressure charts, and these lines of equal temperature, isotherms, are going to intersect or cross height contours. So with baroclinic, the temperature, lines of equal temperature, the isotherms, and the height contours are considered out of phase with one another. Vertical shear is allowed, wind direction changes, and you usually get those wind shear caused by speed changes with height. A thermal wind is present and temperature advection is allowed. Now that's key with baroclinic. Baroclinic atmosphere, you have temperature advection. Because the isotherms, lines of equal temperature, are allowed to cross the height contours. A baroclinic atmosphere is the most common observation observed in the middle latitudes. Here is an example of a baroclinic condition. Notice the solid dark lines here, your height contours, lines of equal geopotential height. Look at the dashed lines, your lines of equal temperature, the isotherms. Do you notice how the isotherms cross? easily intersect and cross over these particular height contours, the solid lines. So the dashed lines easily intersect the solid lines, and this is going to result in a change of temperature. Um, generally out ahead of a trough, you have warmer air advection, or you get warmer temperatures blown into an area on southwest winds. Behind the trough axis, usually you get colder air advection in the northern hemisphere. Northwesterly winds, and overall, your um, temperatures are going to decrease with time. All right, moving ahead now, let's do a quick discussion on long waves versus short waves. Um, I actually feel like I'm doing fairly well with time tonight, so I think the, I'm going to change my plan here in, as we get into the video. I was going to just break this into two parts, but I think I'm going to go for it. I think I'm going to go for it all tonight. Um, we're moving along fairly quickly, a little bit faster than I expected. So let's go for it. Um, long waves in general. This is very important. 
Uh, they're natural large-scale wave patterns in the westerlies. When I say westerlies, um, that's the area in which the winds blow from the west toward the east. Westerlies is a wind belt between 30 degrees and 60 degrees latitude. Where we live here in the United States, we live in the westerly wind belt. So you get these large scale changes. Remember the atmosphere is a fluid and you get these little wave like features develop, these troughs and these ridges. Um, the, the long waves are also known as Rosby waves or planetary waves. Uh, a scientist by the name of Rosby came along and actually demonstrated that these waves actually exist in the atmosphere. Long waves are associated at the 30,000 foot up to the 40,000 foot level in the atmosphere. They're associated with your jet stream winds. Now why do long waves form? Long waves result from the variation of Coriolis force with latitude. Coriolis force is an apparent force in which the winds are going to, or any object, is going to deflect to the right of its attendant path in the northern hemisphere. And Coriolis force it gets stronger with latitude. So in the northern hemisphere, the farther north I go, the greater the Coriolis force. The closer I get to the equator, Coriolis force is not existent at the equator. Um, so there's no real turning or apparent deflection of an object at the equator, especially with the winds. Therefore, there, you never really find a tropical system developing on the equator because there's really no Coriolis force there. The closer you get up to the poles, the stronger the Coriolis force. So the variation, the long waves also result from the variation of temperature between the equator and the pole. Keep this in mind. Long waves are created to help redistribute some of the excessive heat from the equator uh, towards the polar areas. Uh, energy flows from hotter to colder objects. So the warmest temperatures are situated at the equator, the coldest temperatures are at the poles. Long waves are created by the atmosphere as a way of redistributing the excessive heat from south to north. Conservation of absolute vorticity in the mid-latitude westerlies. We talk about long waves. Uh, we have to talk about the conservation of the absolute vorticity. Air parcels absolute vorticity cannot change as it moves through the atmosphere. Thus, the absolute vorticity is going to remain constant. So now if we go back to that formula on the absolute vorticity equals the sum or the addition of the relative and the planetary vorticity, if I'm going to hold the, that lowercase n in the formula, if I'm going to hold that constant, the absolute vorticity, basically we rearrange some things and we get uh, the inverse relationship between the relative vorticity and the planetary vorticity. So basically what I'm saying is if I increase relative vorticity, I decrease the planetary vorticity or vice versa. So if an air parcel's latitude is constant, so let's say an air parcel is at 30 degrees latitude, then the F or the planetary vorticity is unchanged and the relative vorticity is constant. However, if the latitude decreases as a parcel moves closer to the equator, we're getting lower in latitude. So let's say we're going from 30 north to 15 degrees north latitude, then the planetary vorticity is going to decrease and the relative vorticity must increase. Um, so the cyclonic vorticity must increase as parcels move south. So basically what we're saying here is absolute vorticity, that's that, that funky looking N, the N term, absolute vorticity is constant. The squiggly line there, that's your relative vorticity. Plus the F, the F represents planetary vorticity. Planetary vorticity will increase the closer you get to the polar areas. But planetary vorticity decreases the closer you get to the equator, and relative and planetary vorticity are inversely related to each other. So therefore, if you um, decrease your planetary vorticity, that lowercase f, you must increase the relative vorticity as a result. If the latitude increases, so now we're getting closer to the North Pole, let's say the Northern Hemisphere, we're moving from 15 degrees north to 30 degrees north to 45 degrees north, then the planetary vorticity will increase as you get closer and closer to the poles. And the relative vorticity is going to decrease as a result 
Uh, as a result, you get anticyclonic vorticity or negative vorticity, and that increases as parcels move north. So that's why you have ridges uh, generally associated with anticyclonic spinning or vorticity of air parcels, and then with troughs, you got the parcels moving further south, closer to the equator, and your uh, planetary vorticity is getting lower, your relative vorticity is getting higher, therefore you get cyclonic vorticity or positive vorticity um, as in the troughs as compared to the ridges. So in a Rossby wave, or a long wave, as air moves southeastward, the planetary vorticity decreases, forcing cyclonic vorticity to increase and forcing the parcel to move cyclonically at lower latitudes, hence forcing a trough in the lower latitudes. So this is the reason, we talk about the conservation of absolute vorticity of long waves, this is the reason why storm systems generally form, especially the stronger ones, generally form in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, that's, that's south of 30 degrees north latitude because as the parcels move into the base of a long wave trough, they're moving closer to the equator and your planetary vorticity decreases, Cyclonic vorticity, the relative vorticity increases, and that's going to force that parcel to move cyclonically. And that's going to form a storm system, a big time storm uh, in the lower latitudes. In the long wave or Rossby wave, as air moves northeastward after passing the trough axis, so now we're kind of we're working our way up towards a ridge, a big upper level ridge, the planetary vorticity increases because we're getting higher in latitude or closer to the poles. So let's say we're going from 30 degrees north to 45 degrees north. The planetary vorticity will increase. That's going to force that cyclonic relative vorticity to decrease. And that's going to force the parcel to move anticyclonically at higher latitudes or spin like the hands of a clock in that clockwise manner, anticyclonically, hence forcing a ridge in the higher latitudes. So you'll find ridges at the higher latitudes, for example, in the wintertime, your jet stream may, you may have a ridge all the way up into Alaska. You may have a ridge all the way up into Greenland. You may have a trough all the way down to the southern plains, down to the deep south, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And, and, and you get those troughs further south, you get the ridges further north. And this is the reason. It's the conservation of absolute vorticity. You're comparing, planet, you're, you're comparing the planetary vorticity, the small f, with the uh, relative vorticity, the cyclonic relative vorticity. You're comparing them when the planetary vorticity increases, cyclonic relative vorticity decreases. When planetary vorticity decreases, cyclonic vorticity increases. So this cyclonic, anticyclonic oscillation of air parcels as they move towards the equator, towards the poles, towards the equator, towards the poles, this is going to correspond with alternating troughs, ridges, troughs, and ridges it's a pattern that you see in the mid-latitude westerlies. This is all at the jet stream level where you get the dips of the jet stream. Those are associated with your troughs. You get the big ridge, an upside down U-shaped pattern. That's associated with the upper level ridges at the jet stream level. So long waves, think about this, they're at jet stream level. Talk about the conservation of absolute vorticity, very big. Here is an example of a ridge. So you notice these dark lines on this diagram? Those are your height contours, your lines of equal height. Um, the arrows represent your wind flow of the parcels, how your parcels are moving. So if I'm conserving the, the formula on the left there, the conservation of absolute vorticity is equal to relative vorticity, which is that little weird, squiggly, uh, strange looking squiggly S, S letter, plus smaller lowercase f. If I'm conserving or keeping the absolute vorticity, that n, constant, we have an inverse relationship between the uh, relative vorticity, that s-looking letter, and the lowercase f, the planetary vorticity. So if I decrease, if I decrease, in this case, if we're going into a ridge axis, this is upside, upside down U pattern here, on the left, I'm increasing my planetary vorticity because I'm going further north. I'm getting, I'm gaining latitude, I'm getting closer to the poles, my F planetary vorticity increases, therefore my relative vorticity must decrease, I get more of an anticyclonic clockwise flow in the air parcel pattern through the ridge axis. On the right hand side we have the opposite going on. The, the arrows are showing a parcel as if it were moving from north west to southeast, and as we go closer to the equator, 
the lowercase f, the planetary vorticity, is going to get smaller. Therefore, the relative vorticity becomes cyclonic. It increases, and it must increase. <clears throat> so hopefully this all makes sense to you. The differences in the conservation of absolute vorticity, depending on if a parcel is moving towards the poles or moving towards the equator. All right, so climatological positions and amplitudes are influenced. The long wave jet strain pattern, those troughs and those ridges, they're influenced by the oceans, by land masses, and also by the terrain features such as the mountain ranges. The axis of the polar front jet, the PFJ, outlines the long wave pattern. So there's, there's some major influences here. Let's take a look. Long wave characteristics now. If we have an equivalent barotropic environment or atmosphere, the thermal, the dashed lines on the diagram, there are lines of equal temperature, there are five degrees Celsius intervals. Those thermal trough axes, those dashed lines, are generally in phase with the solid black lines on this diagram. So they're in phase. Generally associated with long wave troughs have cold centers and long wave ridges have warm centers. We're talking about long waves. So we're talking about those waves, those ridges and troughs at 30 to 40,000 feet. Troughs and ridges display very little vertical tilt. They're pretty much vertically stacked at this level. And you can find longer waves, the long waves, they're best seen at the 300, which is 30,000 feet, or the 200, 40,000 foot millibar level because the effects of smaller scale waves or eddies decreases with height above mid levels in the troposphere. Those smaller scale waves, those short waves, are generally focused at 700 millibars at 10,000 feet up to about 18,000 feet at 500 millibars. You get above that point in the atmosphere, long waves become the more dominant wave type. Here's an example of a 300 to 200 millibar long wave chart. 300 millibars, again, just another way to tell you we're, we're at 30,000 feet above the ground. 200 millibar waves at 40,000 feet above the ground. So if you were a meteorologist looking at this chart, the solid lines on the chart represent your lines of equal height, your height contours, um, the hacksaw ridge type, uh, hacksaw type line, um, the real jagged line indicates ridge axis, a ridge axis anytime you see it. So that's an area where you have upper level ridge at uh, the jet stream level. And then the, the black dash line represents an area of a trough axis, the lowest atmospheric heights at this level. Um, and so troughs are generally associated with cooler temperatures, ridges are with warmer temperatures. And this is an example of a chart a meteorologist might look at. Finally, a few more things we need to talk about with long waves, then we can move on to short waves, which are really significant weather makers for us here on the Earth's surface. For long waves, the wavelength is generally 60 to 180 degrees of longitude. So long waves cover an expansive area uh, of the Earth. The wave number is going to vary with the season. The number of waves, long waves per hemisphere, usually ranges from 2 to 6. Um, sometimes you get 4 to 5. They tend, to, they tend to be more longer waves in wintertime because you generally tend to have a stronger jet stream. You have stronger lower level temperature infection patterns, um, which, which results in much deeper height gradients and steeper pressure gradients. The smaller the number of waves, the larger the wavelength of a long wave, generally the larger the amplitude as well. If you have a lot of long waves though across the hemisphere, larger number of waves, that usually is associated with a smaller wavelength. So the distance between the ridge axis, the ridge axis, trough axis, the trough axis is much shorter. And you generally have a smaller amplitude in this case. With wave speeds for long waves, the jet stream level, they generally progress slowly. And only long waves can remain stationary or retrogress, or retrograde, move back westerly against that westerly wind flow. Okay. We talk about long waves and the jet stream level with the troughs and ridges. Um, it's very important because sometimes these long waves can get stuck in place. Um, for example, when we have a negative North Atlantic oscillation, we get this huge upper level ridge situated in the Greenland across the North Atlantic, and that just remains stationary for, for possibly weeks on end, 
and that really tends to uh, keep the trough of the colder temperatures over the eastern U.S. and also favors uh, east coast storm development in the wintertime. Um, when you get the huge ridges in the summertime, the long waves, the long wave ridges at the jet stream level uh, over the central part of the U.S., this can result in severe drought conditions because this pattern can persist for long periods of time. So it's very important to take note about long waves. Uh, they can remain stationary or even move very slowly to the west and back up against the normal west to east progression of the winds. With, with long waves, we refer to something that's known as a zonal index. And simply put, this is just a measure of the strength of the west to east wind component at the mid-latitude westerlies. Um, it's best determined, the zonal index is best determined using a 500 millibar hemisphere chart. Uh, again, 500 millibars refers to 18,000 feet above the ground. <clears throat> so with, when we have a zonal flow, if I were to, to do a weather video, a forecast video, and I say um, we have a zonal jet stream flow, I'm saying that the winds are generally blowing from west to east. There's not a lot of troughs or, or ridges at the jet stream level. There's very little north to south energy transfer. Um, so you don't really get much in the way of, of very big storms when you have a zonal west to east flow. Uh, you get a very large north to south temperature variation. Uh, you get a very small west to east temperature variation. Um, generally, uh, with this situation with a zonal, highly zonal flow from west to east, the jet stream blowing straight across west to east, from the Pacific Coast to the East Coast, you usually get um, <clears throat> very changeable weather, but much weaker storm systems. And they move much quicker. <clears throat> now with long waves, with, with a zonal pattern too, you get minimal phasing of the waves. And again, weather systems tend to be weak and move rapidly from west to east. With meridional flow, on the other hand, very important. You want meridional flow for major storm development. And this is why. The basic flow of the jet stream is from north to south. You get a large scale north-south energy transfer. You get a large north to south temperature gradient or variations. Um, I'm sorry, you get a stronger west to east temperature variation. That north to south variation weakens because you have colder air coming down from the far north. <clears throat> you got warmer air coming up from the deep south. You get a very large temperature gradient which in turn results in a very large pressure gradient or change over a specific distance, and that really gets the atmosphere in motion. So with meridiana flow, you get a lot of deep troughs and a lot of big ridges. Uh, weather systems are often strong with cyclones, with storms, producing large cloud and precipitation shields. Very important, especially in the wintertime. How do I find these long waves on the 500 millibar hemispheric chart? Uh, the long wave pattern is distorted uh, due to numerous short waves at this level, uh, but you can get a smooth filtered 500 millibar hemisphere chart that will work the best since short waves have been removed. And you can check that wave progression on hemisphere charts for several days to determine the true position of the long wave troughs and ridges. So to wrap up long waves, I believe this is it. Yeah, we're getting closer now. Um, why are long waves so important? Because they define the average jet stream location and storm track along the polar front. Um, generally, storm systems follow the, they're steered by the upper level jet stream winds. The long waves move cold air equatorward and the warm air poleward in an attempt to balance out the distribution of energy and heat in the atmosphere. That's very, very important. <clears throat> and long waves determine the weather regime at a location for several days or even possibly weeks. When we get those strong upper level ridges that are stuck or those deep troughs that are just stuck, um, you can get a very stormy or very dry type of weather pattern. And the long wave troughs are associated with colder temperatures. So you might have below normal temperatures for an extended period. Or if you're under the upper level long wave ridge at the jet stream level, you may have abnormally warm temperatures. In summertime, you could have record heat. The uh, gradient wind relationship enhances vertical motion in the wave pattern. Uh, I'm not going to get too in depth on the gradient wind relationship again. That's a, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. But just realize this: divergence, that spreading apart, or removal of mass aloft and lifting, vertical motion is favored downstream of the long wave trough axis or upstream of a long wave ridge axis. That's where you get your storm systems developed. Uh, 
convergence where the air comes together and the sinking air motion, the upper levels, the atmosphere down to the surface, that's going to be favored upstream of the long wave trough or downstream of the long wave ridge axes. Clear skies are favored when you have upper level convergence or the addition of mass aloft. We talked about that before. Uh, we talked about that being the damper effect. Uh, determines the weather regime. Long wave position determines the weather regime again at a location for several days or possibly weeks. So that is, that is the basic information on longer waves. They occur at the jet stream level. Um, that's where you see your wavy motion or the wavy pattern of the jet stream, whether they be ridges or troughs. Short waves, on the other hand, are much smaller atmospheric waves with wavelengths less than 3,000 kilometers. Uh, they're also called baroclinic waves, and we talked about baroclinic. Um, they are associated with temperature infection. So we have temperature changes. We have increased baroclinicity or uh, area that's very favorable for storm development. And we get these transient baroclinic cyclones and these anticyclones, high pressure. So lows and high pressure systems you see on the weather maps at the surface. Now short waves form as a result of what's known as baroclinic instability. And this is associated with what's known as the thermal wind and the jet stream. Short waves develop within the long wave pattern as a result of this smaller scale instability. So as I mentioned, long waves, they tend to redistribute the heat and energy and moisture, um, the hotter temperatures transporting them from the lower equi equatorial areas toward the poles, the cold air comes down from the north towards the equator, and the atmosphere is trying to balance itself out via longer wavelengths, long waves. Short waves, there's also this area of what's known as baroclinic instability. Anytime you have any kind of instability, the atmosphere is out of equilibrium, it's out of balance, and therefore these short waves develop as a result. Here is what a short wave, a baroclinic short wave will look like. We get back to our in-phase, out-of-phase relationship. The blue dashed lines represent lines of equal temperature, or isotherms. The um, solid black lines represent the lines of equal height, um, and that's in decameters. Notice the blue dashed lines or isotherms are crossing or intersecting the black solid lines. So we have an out of phase relationship. That tells me that we have a temperature advection pattern setting up. We have colder air moving in. We have warmer air moving into certain locations as well. The dashed line indicates the um, height contour trough axis. The red um, rigid line again represents the ridge axis, the height contour ridge axis. So you can see you have cold air vection behind the trough axis. <coughs> you typically have warm air vection um, behind the ridge axis. It, temperatures will eventually warm up as the winds shift to more of a southerly or southwesterly wind direction. But this is an example of a baroclinic short wave, whether we're talking about a short wave trough represented by the dash line or a short wave ridge, that red solid line. Short waves again are baroclinic which means your isotherms and height contours are out of phase, and this often results in strong temperature infection. Take a look at this. This is a prime example of it right here. So we have changes in temperature. At the 700 millibar, 10,000 foot level, and the 500 millibar, 18,000 foot level on those charts, it most accurately would depict the location and intensity of short waves. <coughs> Excuse me. Typically, contours and isotherms become more in phase above 500 millibars. Here's an example. Uh, it may be more difficult to see this, but I'm showing a 300 millibar chart in the upper left-hand corner, 500 millibar in the lower left, 700 millibar in the upper right, 850 millibar in the lower right. Um, what I'm showing here is if we're looking at the 300 millibar chart, we have a long wave trough axis in the upper left image represented by a black dash line. Um, on the 500 millibar chart, I have a L that's circled over the desert southwest and it's associated with the upper level trough. At 700 millibars or 10,000 feet in the upper right, I have another upper low. You see the dark L with the dark lines circling it. And then at the 850 millibar level, 5,000 feet, I also have an upper level low at 5,000 feet. <clears throat> so when I talk about baroclinic, I'm talking about temperature infection, storm development, 
and the upper levels of the atmosphere are going to support the lower level storm development. Short waves, the wavelengths are much, much shorter, generally less than 30 degrees of longitude. The wave speed is much quicker, especially during the winter time because those fast westerly winds associated with the jet stream blow much stronger. Um, given the same westerly flow, smaller short waves tend to move faster than larger short waves. Waves always move slower than the winds in which they're embedded. For example, let's say a short wave moves eastward at 50 or 60 knots, but is embedded in a 100 knot winds. The winds are blowing through that wave. In the vertical profile of short waves, Generally, baroclinic short waves will tilt vertically. Very important, tilt vertically generally in the westward direction. <clears throat> so as you go progressively up from the surface low towards 850, 5,000 feet, 850 millibars, 700 millibars, 10,000 feet, 500 millibars, 18,000 feet, all the way up to the jet stream level at 300 millibars or 30,000 feet, your stacking is going to stack back towards the coldest air with height. So shortwave troughs are going to tilt vertically toward lower thickness or colder air with height back to the west-northwest of the surface low. Shortwave ridges are going to tilt vertically toward higher thicknesses or warmer air. So shortwave troughs are going to tilt from warm surface lows generally westward toward colder upper level troughs. So those upper level troughs are very important. They're very important for that surface area of low pressure to develop or get deep and it gets stronger. Short wave ridges are going to tilt from colder surface highs generally westward toward warmer upper level ridges. And, and thus there's a short wave trough and ridge axes tilt westward with height. The thermal trough and ridge tilts eastward. Um, in this case we have an out of phase relationship. We have temperature infection, temperature changes. Right and finally as we move into the a little bit more on short waves there's a major short wave. We move the types of short waves. We're talking about a major short wave, which is short wave large enough to significantly distort the long wave pattern. <clears throat> what this mean, it means is if you look at a 300 millibar, 30,000 foot chart, you're going to see this short wave on that chart. Uh, it's reflected through a larger depth of atmosphere than major short wave. So, for example, with a major short wave, <clears throat> you'll see this depicted at both 700 millibars and 500 millibars at 10 and 18,000 feet at both levels. It extends through a greater vertical depth of the atmosphere. The short waves may amplify or phase and become a long wave, thus changing the number of long waves. Behavior will change accordingly. <clears throat> if it goes from a shorter wave to a longer wave, there'll be slower movement of the wave, and you'll change from a baroclinic to an equivalent barotropic state. Now, minor short waves, on the other hand, are smaller short waves, they generally move faster than the major short waves. There's less amplification, uh, causes very little distortion to the long wave pattern. And minor short waves may only extend through a shallow depth of the troposphere. Sometimes they're only reflected at one level. With the minor short wave, you may only see the reflection of that at 700 millibars. How do you find short waves? All right, so if we were to try to identify short waves and figure out where they're located on weather charts, we will look for turning of wind flow and or height contours on isobaric surface. <clears throat> we will look for, uh, on the 700 to 500 millibar charts, we will look for any kind of cyclonic turning in the winds, indicating that trough, or with anticyclonic turning of the winds or clockwise flow would help us indicate where the shoreway of ridge was located. <clears throat> now, height changes on the constant pressure charts with a trough with short waves, thermal trough associated with cold air vection, that's a CAA, is found alone. There's no cyclonic turning of the contour flow. But generally you have height falls or sometimes even small height rises near and downstream of the short wave trough axis. Generally height rises or sometimes small falls near and upstream of that short wave axis. With short wave ridges, generally have height rises or sometimes very small falls near and downstream of the shortwave axis, and generally height falls or sometimes small rises near and upstream of the shortwave uh, ridge axis. Bottom line is with a thermal trough, you really have to have a good eye for identifying shortwaves on the uh, 
700 to 500 millibar charts. Vorticity again refers to that spinning of the air parcel. That's also a good indicator of the location of short waves. And the stacking. Uh, major short waves exhibit a tilted stack, generally toward the west, northwest, or southwest with height. And as a result, for troughs, down toward the warmest air at lower levels. For example, um, generally you're going to have the stacking back with height. Um, so for example, at 500 millibars, we have a trough, a shortwave trough, um, up at 300 millibars, that trough is going to be stacked back to colder air and, and to an upper level trough at that level. <clears throat> this is a really great diagram, which really explains a lot. Um, showing again that the atmosphere is a three-dimensional fluid. Uh, the image on the left is indicating uh, lower pressure at the surface with low-level convergence. <clears throat> Notice the black arrow on the image on the left. See how the air is rising, 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 and from the area of surface low pressure where that convergence is occurring, that area is going to stack back progressively further westward with height. Um, so we have a upper level trough at 700 millibars or 10,000 feet. We have an area of positive vorticity of action PVA out ahead of the short wave at 500 millibars and NVA or negative vorticity of action behind that trough. And then up at 300 millibars we have the long wave trough uh, areas of upper level divergence and areas of upper level convergence due to the jet streak. Uh, results of negative vorticity infection on the right shows a ridge at 300 millibars. You have your jet axis, uh, you're, you're having upper level convergence at 300 millibars, 30,000 feet, which is adding mass to the top of the air column. And that's going to result in that dark black arrow with sinking air motion down to a surface high pressure system at the surface. You have warmer air with height, which is helping to strengthen the upper level ridge. And again, you have sinking air motion, downward vertical motion. You have ridge basically located at 500 millibars all the way down to 700 millibars with the surface high pressure. Right, I'm not really going to cover the short waves continuity too much. Do realize one thing that you generally have a moisture, an area of moisture out ahead of a uh, <clears throat> out ahead of the um, thermal trough axis, the dash lines, you generally have a moisture, an area of moisture out ahead of the height axis, of the, the height trough as well. <clears throat> you do have extreme dry air because the air is sinking behind that shortwave trough axis. Um, sometimes you get crossing east the trough axis in what's known as a dry tongue along a jet stream core. Um, you have very dry mid-tropospheric conditions many times, which indicates sinking air motion. And then finally, the last, uh, well, this is the last slide of the training uh, waves. We talk about intermediate waves. These are waves with wavelengths that are in between the longer waves at that 300 and 200 millibar levels and the shorter waves at the 700 and the 500 millibar levels. Intermediate waves may act more like a long wave than a short wave, or they can act more like a short wave, depending on the situation. And these waves must be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. But keep in mind the major waves of interest. Short waves are major weather makers. This diagram here says it all. Again, this is a great diagram. It shows you the results, uh, how everything stacks, stacks back with height, whether we're talking about um, the low pressure and low level convergence on the left or the high pressure or the um, divergence low-level divergence on the right. Everything is reflected. Uh, again, we can't look at the, at the atmosphere as just a two-dimensional object. We have to look all the way up into the upper levels of the atmosphere, all the way up to the jet stream level as well. Uh, that's really where the support is really shown from the jet stream down to the middle levels of the atmosphere at 18,000 feet, all the way down to you know 10,000 feet and 850 millibars or 5,000 feet. Uh, it's all connected in the vertical the upward and downward vertical motions of the atmosphere are supported by these upper level troughs and the colder air when you're talking about low pressure systems and the warmer air with height and the ridges when we're talking about high pressure systems. But stacking back with height, a key, key point 
We're dealing with short waves. Short waves are weather makers. They get things moving. They're generally associated with vorticity or, or, or certain vorticity patterns. Uh, PVA, positive vorticity direction, is generally resulting in rising air motion, clouds, and storm development. Uh, negative vorticity direction is associated with sinking air motion, drying air as, air as the air sinks, it dries, high pressure, and nice weather, negative vorticity direction. So you want to look at the vorticity chart um, that's generally going to be visible on a at about 18,000 feet, 500 millibar level. You want to take a look at that frequently, especially in the winter time. Uh, you also want to look at where your jet streak is. You know, are you in a upper level divergent or upper level convergent area of the jet streak? Uh, but we covered major versus minor short waves. We covered uh, generally that these type of short waves move much quicker than longer waves. Well, we talked about short waves being paraclinic, where we have temperature changes. The blue dashed isotherms lines of equal temperature are crossing these solid black lines of high contours. Uh, therefore, you have temperature infection, temperature changes. Um, with short waves, you get storm development. And, and long waves, mostly up at the jet stream level, 300 and 200 millibars, 30,000 to 40,000 feet. Long waves, think, think the jet stream, where you see those dips or troughs and those upside down shaped U's, those ridges, um, they generally indicate, uh, they're very important, very, very important. Differences between zonal flow, highly zonal in, uh, high zonal index versus a meridional. Uh, that's very important as far as storm development. And that wraps things up tonight. Spot on weather. I really hope you enjoyed this training on waves, waves in the atmosphere. Atmospheric waves are so important. Again, look at the atmosphere as a fluid, three dimensional. Um, you got to look at it all the way up to the jet stream level, from the ground all the way up. There's not just one level we look at. When we, we're determining whether a storm is going to develop and to deepen or get stronger or whether that storm will remain rather weak. Um, so thank you so much for joining, uh, joining me tonight. I know the video was a little lengthy, but I really wanted to push through it. There's so many important points here in the Atmospheric Waves video uh, here in the Summer Video Training Series. we got a lot more exciting videos to come after this week. Can't wait to share that with you. In the meantime, take care. I hope, hope everybody's summer is going really well. It's super Super well for everybody. Take care, everybody. This is Spot on Weather. If we're not spot on, we're not doing it right. Take care, everybody. Have a pleasant, pleasant evening.